two Sundays ago, I began a teaching entitled The Exceeding Riches of God's Grace. And in my discourse, I highlighted the value and the importance of the greatest and most wonderful miracle we receive from God, which of course is our salvation through Christ's sacrifice on the cross. That is, there is no greater miracle than our reborn experience when we were transferred from one kingdom into another. From the kingdom of darkness, we were transferred into the kingdom of God's dear Son, and God by His Spirit recreated us in the Spirit, in our inner man, and we became new creations in Christ Jesus. Furthermore, I say that our rebirth experience is the greatest and the most significant miracle of Christ's work on the cross. There's nothing greater. To be brought into relationship with our Heavenly Father and to be able to share intimacy with the Lord in the Spirit, there is nothing greater than that. And we should value and highlight and testify of this miracle whenever the opportunity arises. Knowing what I know from my own experience being in the ministry for almost 41 years now, few of us realize the magnitude of what happened to us when we got born again and became new creations in Christ. And you may wonder, why do I make such a statement? And I will explain. Because over the 48 years that I have been a Christian, most of the testimonies I have heard in church have been centered around physical and material blessings. In other words, blessings that appeal to our five physical senses rather than being rescued from the kingdom of darkness and being transferred into the kingdom of God's dear Son. And the truth of the matter, whether we would like to acknowledge it or not, is that we have become so materialistic that we have lost sight uh, or the greatest miracle that we received has been obscured uh, through our union with Jesus Christ. And we need to revisit and remeditate on this wonderful miracle that has taken place. And perhaps we have allowed the cares of this life, as Jesus said, and the desires of other things to obscure, obscure, hide the realities of our redemption in Jesus Christ. To be forgiven of our sins and to be able to come into the presence of God boldly because we have been made righteous is it is so much greater than any physical or material blessing and many of us in the church though born of the spirit and filled and baptized in the holy spirit are not fully aware of the spiritual transformation that we have come into or the wonderful privileges that we have received through our union with Jesus Christ. If the reality of our rebirth or our union with Christ, which is far greater than any other blessing, does not enthuse us with passion, with joy, with excitement, then I believe we have lost sight of who we are in Christ, whose we are in, in Christ, and what we have come into through this new dispensation that Christ brought us into. And I have mentioned last Sunday that the early church were so joyous, so enthusiastic about their salvation 
that no matter what they went through, no matter what persecution they went through, no matter what they suffered, what they've endured, it could not steal the joy of their great salvation. In one of the Psalms, David prays and he says, Lord, restore to me the joy of thy great salvation. And many of us, I believe, need to pray that the Lord may restore that joy, that enthusiasm, that excitement, that passion, that we are indeed the children of the living God, that God is our heavenly Father. Jesus is the Lord of our lives, and he has given us so much more than the eye can see, than our senses can feel. And the, the reason why the early Christians were so enthusiastic about their salvation is because their faith and their joy was not based on things they could see or feel, but on things they could not see, such as the love for Christ and their intimate fellowship with the Spirit. And Peter confirms this truth when he writes to them, saying, in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 8, we read the following. Writing to the early church, he says, Whom having not seen, you love. And though now you do not see him, yet believing, you rejoice with inexpressible joy and full of glory. That's, that's so precious. And uh, these disciples, these early disciples, they, they were invested uh, into, the, into the cause of Christ. They lived for Christ. Christ was not just their Savior, but he was their Lord. And they rejoiced in that salvation that no matter what took place around them, it did not steal the joy because they knew that their eternal home was not here but in Christ and in heaven. So, now I want to proceed from where I left off two Sundays ago. Next to our salvation in Christ and the born-again experience, the most significant and the most powerful revelation we can receive from the Spirit through the Word is the revelation of our new identity in Christ Jesus. 2 Corinthians 5.17 tells us who we really are when we got born again, when Christ came into our lives and we've made him the Lord of our lives. The word of God says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away, and behold, all things have become new. The revelation of who you are in Christ is one of the most significant and powerful revelations we can receive. Not just knowing who we are in our head, but deep down in our hearts, we know who we are in Christ. And unless we have a clear understanding of this truth and allow this truth to influence us, to govern our thoughts, to govern our attitude, we will always struggle in living the kind of life that Jesus came to give us. We must come to terms with who we are in Christ. Know your identity in the Spirit. Your spirit man is the real you. You live in a body. You have to have an earth suit to remain on the earth. But your body is not the real you. The real you is your spirit man. The one that's been recreated by Christ Jesus and made a new creation. You have a soul which is made up of your will, your emotions and your intellect and you live in this body. You are not a body, you are a spirit being. You have a soul and you live in this body. And we must come to terms with 
who we are in Christ and allow our spiritual identity to not only define who we are, but empower us to be who God called us to be and do what God called us to do on this side of heaven. In my experience, over a long period of being in the ministry and walking with people, believers in Christ, this is where most Christians struggle to see themselves as God sees them or to know themselves as God knows them. Because when God looks at you, he does not see the old you that you were. He does not see an old sinner. He sees Christ in you. He sees you through the blood, through the cross. He knows you as such and addresses you as such. He refuses to know anything else. That's what the Bible says. That's why I say most believers struggle to embrace by faith their identity in Christ. And that's the reason why most of us are defeated in life. Because we don't know who we are. We don't know what we are called to do. The devil takes advantage of our lack of knowledge in this area by oppressing us with all kinds of negative and oppressive thoughts and emotions. Let me say this. Lack of confidence is the result of ignorance. Lack of confidence in your life is the result of a lack of knowledge. For example, thoughts of guilt, thoughts of shame, thoughts of unworthiness. We hear so many times, I'm not worthy, Lord. I'm just such a worm. I can't do this. I can't do that. I'm not educated enough. I don't have enough money. This and this, and we go on. Lack of self-esteem. Another big one is condemnation. How many believers are under severe condemnation today? And the results of that is our ignorance in regards to who we have been made in Christ Jesus, who we are in Christ. And if you don't have a revelation of your identity, the enemy will oppress you, will depress you with guilt, with shame, with unworthiness, lack of self-esteem, and condemnation. The devil decimates and devours those who remain in the grips of ignorance. God said in Hosea chapter 4, verse 6, that my people, he says, are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. Not lack of money, not lack of education, not lack of power, not lack of faith, but lack of knowledge. Lack of revelation knowledge is our greatest enemy when it comes to resisting the devil. The revelation of our identity in Christ is the foundation of our victory. It is the platform from which we fight the good fight of faith. If you don't have a foundation beneath your feet when you're resisting the enemy, you cannot stand before him. He will deceive you. He will lead you astray. He will distract you. That's why I say that the, 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 it is the, the platform and the foundation from which we fight the good fight of faith. Now, to know and to regard ourselves the way our Heavenly Father knows us is our greatest boast in the Lord. Because Paul said that if you want to boast, you can boast in the Lord. Let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. Paul the Apostle said, I am who I am by the grace of God. He declared who he was. He calls himself an apostle and a messenger of Christ. 
He's not ashamed to declare his identity in Christ. Though he says, I was the worst of sinners, and though I persecuted the church and I'm not worthy, God revealed his great mercy and grace towards me. And I am who I am by the grace of God. And so we are who we are and what we are by the grace of God. And not because of what we have done or not have done. That's got nothing to do. Salvation is by grace through faith and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. So to know yourself and to regard yourself the way the Father knows you is your greatest boast in the Lord and your most prized possession or revelation we have both on earth and in heaven. Listen, there is no greater joy than knowing you are loved by the Father like no one else would love you. No one thinks more highly of you than your heavenly Father. No one loves you, no one cares for you more than your heavenly Father. And because of his great love toward us, the Bible says, he has given us a name that is above every name. That's what it means to be a Christian, little Christ. He has given us his name, a name that is above every other name, given us a place in his very bosom, and made us sit together, the Bible says, in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Your body is here on earth, but your spirit man is seated with Christ in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power. God has given you that wonderful privilege and honor to be seated with Christ in the heavenly places. Why did God do that? Why did he bestow such extra, extravagant love and grace upon us? And the Bible tells us why he did that. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 through 7, that in the ages to come, he might show, show what? The exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. That's why he did what he did. That in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. We serve a wonderful God. When you know these truths, you cannot help but love God. When you have a revelation of these realities, you are filled with enthusiasm and passion and excitement because of what God has done for you and I. And the Bible says in Ephesians 4.24 that we are to put on this new identity in Christ. He tells us to do that. He says, put on this new man who was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. We are to put it on. Well, Romans 13 and verse 14. We do that we, huh? by doing that, by putting on the new man, the word of God says we will make no provision for the flesh. There it is. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ, and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. Well, here's the question. How do we do that? How do you put on this new identity? Ephesians chapter 6 calls it the armor of God, the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, the shield of faith, the belt of truth, the shoes of preparation. How do we do that? I mean, it's not a physical identity, it's a spiritual identity. The way we do that is by believing what the Bible says about us 
and renewing our minds with the truths that are revealed therein. That's how we put on the new man. We believe what he says about us. We renew our way of thinking according to what the Bible reveals in regard to who we are, what we have, what we can do. In the book of Judges, chapter 6, tells the story of a mighty man of God, and he was a mighty warrior, actually, but he didn't know who he was with him. He didn't know who he was. He forgot that God was with him, and as a result, the Bible says, he was hiding in the cave for fear of his enemies. I'm sure you know who he is. He and his people were plundered again and again by the enemies because they forgot who was on their side and where they came from. His name was Gideon. You read it in Judges chapter 6 and you read the story of Gideon. God called him a mighty man of valor. And he didn't know who he was. He says, Lord, are you talking to me? If I'm a mighty man of valor and you are the God of miracles, why are we in such uh, a situation that we find ourselves being plundered by the enemies now and again? They are ruining us. They are stealing from us. They are oppressing us. Well, because they didn't know who they were. They forgot their God. They forgot who was with them. So, but when he discovered his real identity in God, the first thing he did, he came out of the shadows of fear. And with only 300 men, the Bible says he defeated an entire army made up of thousands of people. Just 300 men. It doesn't matter what you face. What matters is who's with you. It doesn't matter who comes against you. What it matters is whose you are and who is with you. When you know who you are in Christ, you become fearless, bold, and courageous. The Bible says that the righteous are as bold as a lion. They're not afraid. And Gideon discovered who he was because God didn't give up on him. He began to encourage him and he began to show him who he really was, that he's a mighty man of valor. And again and again, he talked to him until he came to the place where he believed the word of God. Now, what about David? How was he able to face and defeat Goliath? He was only a teenager. Goliath was a giant, a man of war. And he won many battles for his nation. How was he able to face him with such courage and boldness and not only face him, but defeat him? Why? Because David knew who was with him and he had a clear understanding of his identity and his covenant with God. He knew he had a covenant with God. That's why he called Goliath the uncircumcised Philistine. Uncircumcised means he has no covenant with God. It doesn't matter how big he is. It doesn't matter how strong he is. It doesn't matter what weapons he has. He is a defeated foe because God is not with him. God is with me. I have a covenant with God. And he went against him in the name of the Lord and he defeated him. 16, 17-year-old boy. Most believers, and I say that without any exaggeration, are hiding in the shadows of fear and unbelief today. They lack confidence and faith in the Lord, but God is looking for those who know who they are in Christ and what they can do through him. And he's calling the church today, and each one of us, step out of the shadows of fear, step out of the shadows of doubt, and begin to believe who is with you and who you are in Christ Jesus. 
when the Jews, if you recall in John chapter 1, verse 23, sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to inquire as to the identity of John the Baptist. They came to him saying, who are you? Are you a prophet? Who are you? And this is what John replied. I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. John didn't say, well, I'm the son of Zechariah, the priest and Elizabeth, and I, I have come about, I was born through a miraculous, uh, you know, my, my mother was barren and he gave, he gave birth to me and on and on. He didn't say any of those things. What John did, and that's what we should be doing, he looked into the book of Isaiah and found his identity in the scriptures and he declared exactly that without fear and without doubt. This is who I am. I am the voice. Where did he get that from? From Isaiah chapter 40. That's why we should know the scriptures, because the scriptures will reveal your unique identity in God, your unique assignment in God, so that you don't live your life experimenting, but you live your life with precision and with purpose. This is who I am, John said. I'm just the voice of one crying in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord. And this is what we should be doing. We look into the scriptures, we find our identity in Christ, and we boldly declare to whosoever wants to hear that we are in Christ, and this is what we have in him. I have discovered something. Identity precedes behavior and attitude, not vice versa. Identity precedes, comes before your behavior. When you know whose you are and who you are in Christ, you will begin to act accordingly. Did you get that? When the devil comes at you, and he will, just like he attacked the Lord Jesus in the wilderness, and he'll come to you every day. In, in fact, the first thoughts that you get in the morning when you wake up, with his lies, with his half-truths to deceive you, to oppress you, telling you that you are unworthy, trying to make you feel guilty, and ashamed because of what you've done the day before and what you didn't do. And, and he will do that. He'll bring thoughts and feelings and emotions. We should rise up in our spirit man in the name of Jesus and declare our identity to him in Christ. We need to speak to him. Jesus did. When he comes to you or members of your family, with symptoms of sickness and disease, endeavoring to make you sick, you should rise up in your spirit, man, and give him a piece of your renewed mind. Did you get that? When he comes with threats, endeavoring to intimidate you with fear, you should again rise up and declare whose you are and what God promised you. You need to tell him, listen here, Mr. Devil, Give me a few minutes and let me educate you a little bit in regards to who you're dealing with. Address him as such. When fear comes, address it as such. When doubt comes, address it as such. When symptoms attack your body, address them as such. God has given you a mouth and has given you a word and we should use. Your mouth is the launching pad of your, of your spiritual weapons, and there is no greater weapon than the Word of God coming out of your mouth and belief from your heart. Listen here, Mr. Devil. Let me educate you. I am a child of the living God, 
according to the word of God. I'm born of his spirit. I have the life and the nature of God within my spirit. And the word says, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. And because I'm in Christ, I am forgiven. Because I'm in Christ, I am blessed. Because I'm in Christ, I've been made righteous through my union with Christ. Furthermore, the Bible says, I'm blessed in the city and I'm blessed in the field. I am blessed going out and I'm blessed coming in. The Bible says that surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. So get out of here. I am in Christ and in Christ, the Bible says, I'm the head and not the tail. I'm above only and not beneath. And furthermore, Mr. Devil, because I'm in Christ, Jesus was made unto me wisdom. I am wise. I am redeemed from the curse. I am highly favored and sanctified. And the one living on the inside of me is far greater than you who's on the outside. And the word of God says, I have overcome in Christ, you and all your demon spirits. There is nothing you can do, Mr. Devil. And there is nothing in this life. And there is no weapon that you have fashioned against me that will separate me from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, my Lord. And furthermore, the Bible says, and give him the word of of God coming out of your mouth. Do you think he'll stay around for long? No. He'll flee. He won't stay around. He'll leave you. He'll come back again. And we need to learn how to resist him. And listen, nothing that comes from outside defeats us. What defeats us in life is the weakness of our spirits. If we don't take care of our spirit man, to nourish him, to feed him by meditating in the word, by staying in prayer, by disciplining ourselves with our spiritual disciplines, we are weak. And when you're weak, you cannot stand up. You cannot resist him. That's why we need to fill our minds and our hearts with the word of God. And we need to learn to fight the good fight of faith by declaring the word of God in the face of opposition, in the face of contradictory circumstances. We need to say to ourselves often, I do that. I'm not moved by what I see. I'm not moved by what I feel. I'm only moved by what I believe. And I believe the word of the living God. And I say exactly what I believe. Let your ears hear the word coming out of your mouth. Furthermore, in 2 Corinthians 5.16, let's look at that verse of scripture together. The Bible says, therefore, from now on, now on meaning after the death and the resurrection of Christ, we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him thus no longer. So the Bible says we should endeavor to know no one after the flesh or after their external experience. The Greek word there for regard, we regard no man. The word regard in the Greek is to know or knowing. We should get to know people after the spirit and not after the flesh. What kind of spirit do they operate in? We should not judge them by the color of the skin. We should not judge them by the natural identity, the nationality, or any other external identification. Jesus rebuked the two disciples of his, if you, if you remember. They wanted John and James. They wanted to call fire from heaven to devour and to burn those who did not receive them in a certain village. I think it was Samaria. And here is the account as recorded by Luke's gospel. Luke chapter 9, verse 54 to 56. And when his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, 
Do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them just as Elijah did? But he turned and rebuked them and said, you do not know what manner of spirit you're of. For the son of man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went to another village. You see, here is what I want us to catch. These disciples didn't know yet exactly what manner of spirit they were operating under. They thought that that's what God wanted because they read in the Old Testament when Elijah called fire from heaven and devoured his enemies, or was it Elisha? Some of them, even today, they misquote scripture in order to twist their own purposes. We must come to the realization that we are not dealing with flesh and blood. We're not dealing with human beings. We are dealing with spiritual wickedness in the heavenly places that influence people to do what they do and to say what they say. So if we know that we're not fighting against people but against spirits behind them, we will go to the root of what's going on and deal with those spirits because we have authority over them, Jesus said. He said in Luke's gospel chapter 10, he said, behold, I give you power and authority to tread upon serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you. He also said, I give you power to loose and to bind. So if you recognize the spirit that they are operating under, you can, in your prayer, bind that spirit and loose the spirit of God so that they can come under the influence of God, under the influence of the spirit of God. And that's how we intercede and we fight our battles. But to them, we show love, we show kindness to people, we give them grace, we show them mercy, but we attack the forces that are behind them that cause them to do what they do and say what they say. Amen. So, again, when we accurately discern the kind of spirit they are influenced by, we will know how to deal with the spirit, not the person, but the spirit behind the person. When Peter spoke up, you remember, to dissuade the Lord Jesus from going to Jerusalem to be crucified, remember what Jesus did. He identified that spirit that spoke through Peter and was influencing Peter and rebuked it by saying, get behind me, Satan. You are an offense to me, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of man. Do you see that? Jesus rebuked Satan, who was speaking through Peter. And at the same time, he showed Peter that his mind was not full of the things of God or the word of God, but was full of the things of men. He thought like a natural human being. Rather than seeing things from God's perspective, he began to see things from man's perspective. That's why when Jesus said to the disciples, it is far better for you that I go away than stay, they couldn't understand it because they were thinking like mere human beings and not like spiritual beings. Jesus said to Peter, your mind is not full of the things of God, but the things of men. And you know what? He would say the same things to us today if our minds are not filled with God's things, with God's word, or in other words, if our thoughts are not aligned with God's will and God's purpose for our lives, the spirit will gently rebuke us and say, you're not thinking right here. You're not thinking scripturally and spiritually. You're allowing your emotions. You're allowing your hurt. You're allowing your pain to speak through you. You're allowing your natural understanding to interpret things for you. And your thoughts are not aligned with my will and my purpose for your life. Do you see why it's so important to renew our minds with God's thoughts, to think the way God thinks? On the other hand, 
If we make an effort to know and to recognize one another by our spiritual identity, we will learn to love one another. We will learn to respect, to accept, and to honor each other's person and each other's place in the body of Christ. We would be tolerant. We would be patient. We would be forgiving if we recognize each other with our new identity, that you're a child of God, that you're born of His Spirit, that you're my brother in the Lord, you're my sister in the Lord. And I come to a place when I have that recognition that I come to honor you. I don't allow my flesh, I allow my spirit to rise up and to give you proper recognition and honor and acceptance. And not only that, when we are out of line, we will also have the courage to admit it or correct each other in the spirit of humility for the sake of the health of the entire body. Imagine if a pastor turned to somebody and said, get behind me, Satan. I, he would walk out the door. He said, who do you think you are calling me Satan? Oh, who do you think you are? You correcting me. But if we are humble, if we are pliable in the hands of God, and if we allow the Spirit of God to lead, to guide, to teach us, we will grow. We will mature. And thank God we are learning. We are growing. We are maturing. We might not be where we should be, but thanks be to God we are not where we used to be. Would you say amen to that? We are learning new things. We are growing. We are developing. Our minds are renewed. And I look at myself. When I was 30 years of age, <laughs> I, I, I thought differently than I think now. I did things differently. I even ministered differently than I do minister now. When I came and I became 50 years of age, <laughs> I wasn't the same person that I was when I was 30 years of age. There's a progression, there is a growth, and we should all be growing, spiritually speaking, in the knowledge of God. We should be maturing. Now in my 70s, I'm not the same person I was when I was 50. I think differently. My way of ministering to people is different. You know, I remember as I was sitting around the table once a number of years ago with all the sons in the spirit that I was training, one of them piped up and said, Pastor, when I first met you, I saw you with a stick in your hand. But after I walked with you for years, I see you now with a towel in your hand. There has been a transformation. There has been a change in my way of ministering, in my way of seeing people, in my way of understanding people. Now I give them far more grace and far more room and, and, and mercy than I was giving them when I was 30 years old. Do you understand where I'm coming from? We grow in our understanding. We develop in our character. We mature in the spirit and we go from strength to strength and from faith to faith. Our perspective changes, the way we do things change, the way we relate to God and the way we relate to others change as we grow and mature. And I trust it is the same with you. You are learning, you are growing, you are maturing. I know some lessons are so hard to learn and so painful. And I said, I said to Michael the other day, the greatest and most valuable revelations and lessons I've learned is not in my success, it was in my failure. They came out of pain. They came out of deep disappointment. They came out of hurt, but I've learned and I have grown through it all. When your heart is pliable and adaptable, God will take you from one season of your life into the next. Not just naturally, but spiritually speaking. You, 
in, from, from a young man, the Bible says we become fathers. And from fathers, we become grandfathers. Amen. You, the things that you've learned, the things that you have uh, received from the Lord, we should pass them on. Find somebody and train them and teach them and love them. Not through preaching, but through relationship. Amen. So, we have a lot of work to do when it comes to understanding, clearly understanding, who am I? Who am I? What does God say about me? What has he given me? Who am I in the spirit? You will find your identity only in the word. No one knows who you really are. Only the Lord knows who you are. Only the Lord knows what you're capable of. Only the Lord knows what dream he's given you. And the only way you're going to get it is through fellowship and intimacy with his word and with his spirit. And I pray that you will seek him fervently until he gives you understanding, revelation, and knowledge. And live your life with purpose, with precision. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for what you've done for us in Christ. Thank you that you have taken us and recreated us in Christ Jesus. And you've hidden us in the Lord. The Bible says that our life is hid with Christ in God. When he appears, we shall also appear with him in glory. You have made us righteous. You've forgiven us all of our sins, past, present, and future. You've washed us in your precious blood. You have placed your very own spirit, the spirit of your son that cries, Abba, Father, within us. You've made us your children. We are the children of the, of the living God. We are the royal priesthood. We are a chosen Lord, nation, generation, your word says who have been called out of darkness into your marvelous light. For all of these wonderful blessings that we cannot see them, but believe them with our heart, we give you thanks. We give you praise for the wonderful miracle of our salvation, for the wonderful miracle of our recreation in Christ. I pray that the spirit of wisdom and revelation, Father, will flow richly in our spiritual family will continue to reveal things in the Spirit. Fill us with the Spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of you. Fill us with the understanding of who you are in us and who we are in you and what our purpose and our calling in life is so that we may walk with precision and with purpose every single day of our lives. We ask this and we thank you in Jesus' name, amen.